The answer is the Lord Jesus. The Bible says in Psalm 111 that we are to praise the Lord. And I would exalt the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. So Lord of heaven above, we do extol you, Lord, with our hearts as we join together as your people to offer praise and worship to your holy name for your mercies on our souls last week. Lord, we start this week with you, Lord, and with each other, and with purpose and plan that you have set for us. Lord, we have come to understand your mercies in a greater way this week, I pray. Lord, I pray that the, the goodness of the Lord is in all of those mercies and all the privileges that we have, Lord, would be exalted in our heart. Lord, you've protected us from calamity and sickness. Lord, you've provided with your open hand all that we've needed. And Lord, that's an incredible mercy from heaven above. Lord, you place us right here in the land and in a love relationship in this church, Lord, to come together and share our hearts. So I pray, Lord, you would make that grow. Lord, you would foster that in our hearts in such a way, Lord, that you would be glorified. So, Lord, help us to receive your word this morning, Lord, the word of truth, the word of power, Lord, by giving us a humble and contrite spirit, a spirit that's ready to hear your word, a, hear, a spirit that's ready to receive your word and not to stand over in judgment, but for your word of truth to lay upon us, Lord, and to, um, and to weaken the pride-filled man in all of us, so, Lord, help us to see this aright. Lord, speak through your servant that your word would come in power. Lord, may we reflect on the verse that says, Who are we, O man, to talk back to God? For all of your word is pure and true. So come, Lord Jesus, and do what we can't do for ourselves. Increase our faith. Give us a heart and a hunger for your word. Give us the truth, Lord, to convict us and to convince us of your holy nature, of what this place is like, of what we're like, what you're like, and what is to come. Lord, these are the great mercies from heaven that settle our souls. So, Lord, again, we praise your holy name for this privilege of coming together and celebrating the resurrection from the dead. Lord, speak clearly from your word to our souls, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And to that, especially to Afghanistan, if you've been watching the videos coming out, it's pretty rough. They take people's phones, if they find the Bible on it, they kill them on the spot. So brothers and sisters, uh, again, we have the privilege of looking at Romans 9, going through it. You know, it is so such a blessing that our pastor doesn't steer away from Romans 9. Many churches won't look at this carefully because this is these are words that really can tear at the heart of a church. Some of the most misunderstood verses are in Romans 9, and these verses tend to create the most division in churches. But I encourage you when you hear the message today, when you hear the word, to come to understand. Who is the sovereign? Is it God or is it us? We all have to reconcile that at some point in our hearts. And I encourage you to look upon your maker with reverence and fear of his power and his might. But also to look at his tender loving mercies. So brothers and sisters, I'm going to be reading Romans 9, but... With the pastor's indulgence, I'm going to read the last two or three verses of Romans 8. Because we don't bring this text forward as if it's some sort of exclusive wall that you have to climb over. This is all of God. And I encourage you, if you're here today, you're not here because anyone dragged you or forced you. You're here because your heart has been has received some tender mercy of God. And if we understand this mercy in a greater way, He will use it to grow our souls individually and collectively for His glory. So 
So brothers and sisters, if you would stand for the reading of God's Word. start with Romans 8, verse 37. In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I speak the truth in Christ. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the history of the Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because are they his descendants are they Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet, before the twins were born, or had done anything good or evil, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's will or effort, but on God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raise you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom He wants to have mercy, and he hardened whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it? Why'd you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purpose, and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show His wrath and make His power known, bore with great patience the objects of His wrath, prepared for destruction? What if He did this to make the riches of His glory known to the objects of His mercy, whom He prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom He has also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As He says in Hosea, I will call them My people who are not My people, and I will call her My loved one 
who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of Israelites be like on the sand on the seashore, only a remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out His sentence on this earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah had said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been like Gomorrah. May God bless the reading of His Word to your soul. Amen. It is utterly overwhelming. Romans 9, this doctrine of election. God's sovereign election choice. God's sovereign grace, irresistible call of those whom he has saved is for the glory of his name. Amen. And Lord, we do praise you and thank you for it. Help us to see it even clearer this morning and appreciate it even more greatly this day. And may it profoundly affect us in greater measure today and beyond than it has previously. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 25, as he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people my people, and her who was not my beloved, beloved. So Paul here, to continue um, his instruction on this election, uses quotes from Hosea and from Isaiah show forth Israel's rejection of the Messiah that it was predicted by the prophets that's what verse 25 says and it's spoken from it's, uh, quoted from Hosea 2 verse 23 I will show her for myself in the land I will have compassion on her who have not obtained compassion and I will say to those who are not my people you are my people and they will say you are my God what a beautiful thing to be able to say, you are my God, or you are my King, like we said a few minutes ago. In Hosea, again, the uh, analogy in the um, picture from the Old Testament, Hosea chapter 1, with the illustration of uh, Gomer. Hosea 1, verse 2, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. And so he went and took Gomer, the daughter of the blind, and she conceived and bore him a son. And then in verse 10, Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, You are not my people, it will be said to them, you are sons of the living God. So, Gomer's unfaithfulness to Hosea is an obvious illustration of the Israelites' unbelief, spiritual unfaithfulness to God, and ultimately was Israel's rejection of the Messiah the Lord used to have the gospel go forth to Gentiles. So, let's never forget that we were once not a people but now we are God's people. And as I was thinking about that this week, and I've just been having a great time in Romans 9, just basking in the glory of it. I was thinking, okay, so now we're the people of God. Now we're the people of God. Well, what's going to happen next? And the Lord has brought to my mind, I've said this to you before, I'm so thankful for the verses in the Bible that I memorized as a new Christian because they just keep coming back. And I don't memorize Scripture presently at all the way I used to memorize Scripture. And, I, and I'm sure I need to do that. I keep writing in my journal, memory verse, memory verse, memory verse, memory verse. And then I don't go back at this point. 
and start committing them to memory, which I need to do, which we all need to do. But I'm thankful I can remember the ones from 1983, 45, 86, 87, 88, 89, whatever the year was. And I kept thinking, now we're the people of God. What next? What does that mean? Well, 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. Now we are children of God. We're growing in Christ likeness. We're growing in holiness. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. <clears throat> now we're children of God. How are we to be living now? Verse 3, anyone who has this hope. So you got this hope fixed on you that you are a child of God. We have this hope fixed on us. Everyone who has this hope fixed on them, it says purifies himself just as he is pure, going on in that pursuit of holiness. All because of God's sovereign election, his choice. Verse 26 says, And it shall be <coughs> that in that place, <coughs> and it shall be in that place where it is said to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. So whether it was the restoration of the Jews or the conversion of the Gentiles, it's all due to the powerful, sovereign grace of God. His irresistible call. When that sovereign grace goes forth onto those whom God is saving, it doesn't go empty, and it doesn't go void, it doesn't go back, come back without a return. And really, I'm thinking, I've said this before, um, it's likely we're going to have to go, we're going to have to go to Romans 10 and 11 too, um, in the context of this uh, doctrine of election, because really, we've been touching on sovereign grace. It comes out really loudly in chapter 10, uh, with uh, the verses 10 through 13, or 1 through 13. Anyway, it's, it's, just such an, it's just such an utterly overwhelming truth. So we have time, right? You know, I don't know where we have to go. We have time if we want to do 10 and 11. Maybe we'll do 10 and 11. So oh, what blessings that we have in the fact that we are now children of God. Think about it. We are sons and daughters of the living God. Verse 27 says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. We know all all disciples, all followers of Christ, all those who have been born again, all those who have been given the living hope for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, are Israel, our true spiritual Israel. And though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. Mm, let's never forget, again, beloved, that we are among the Red remnant <clears throat> who have been saved. Remnant means a few. It really does mean a few. Matthew 22, verse 14. I'm sure I read this last week or one of the other weeks where many are called, but few are chosen. The gospel goes out to all. The call goes out to all. Few are chosen. And again, this is <coughs> meant for the believer. <coughs> To well up and within us just a greater appreciation as we swim in the eye. I know why I like this chapter 9 so much. Okay? Because it is about sovereignty. Brother John keeps bringing that out, right? It's just about, in general, God's sovereignty. Sovereign in election, sovereign over everything. And so I'm sure I'm basking in the glory of it even greater because. Yeah, I believe in God's sovereignty. We all believe in God's sovereignty. But I live sometimes a little more like a practical atheist, sadly to say, in that area than I do um, in his sovereignty. I live a little bit at times too much like, I've said it before, everything depends upon me and not upon God. And I have sometimes, and, and maybe you have a struggle in this area, well, everybody's different in in where they are in their walk and relationship with the Lord. But I struggle with sometimes God's sovereignty. He really, I really struggle sometimes, not only when it relates to salvation, but God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Sometimes I blur that line, you know, of okay, I got to do diligence and I have to pray and I have to have wisdom and I need direction. But 
then sometimes the weight of my mind goes too strongly onto me and what I'm supposed to do as opposed to resting in his sovereignty. So I'm sure that's why I'm enjoying this personally so much. Verse 28 says, For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. Execute. It means bring to an end, complete, bring to pass. And then it says in verse 29, And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of the Sabbath had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. Unless the Lord, that word there, or saying the Lord of the Sabbath, Sabbath, refers to the Lord of hosts. This is an Old Testament title for which God refers to as all surpassing, all encompassing sovereignty. The Lord of hosts. So whenever you read the Bible, and it's, a lot of times I see, you see it in Psalms. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts. That's referring to the sovereign God. I was telling somebody yesterday who thinks that they manipulated and controlled the circumstances of their life to the point that they went off and did what they wanted to do for four days, and they felt like it was God, they felt like this was my, their choice, they were executing the plans, the pieces, the manipulation, the control over everything that was going on, and they had their four days of, uh, this is what I wanted to do, and it turned out that God in His sovereignty rescued that person from the choices and decisions that they were making that would have been devastating to them and took them and removed them by the sovereign grace of God, by the sovereign hand of God, removed them from that situation and from that circumstance at the hand of two more Christians that God had plopped into this person's life. God's presence has been in this person's life since day one. Moved that person from out of the danger that they were in into a place of safety and now a place of refuge to continue to accomplish his plan and purpose for this person's life and they thought all along I'm doing what I want to do and I'm going to execute my plan and it's God's sovereign plan that's accomplished in the life of his people and I said to that person, I said, I don't know how many people I've seen in this world that God's hand has just so been on as it's been on your life. Because that person's life could have and should have way beyond now, way before even now, it just went into the tank. Okay? And yet God has rescued and continues to rescue that person for the glory of his name and ultimately for what he, is, what he wants to accomplish in the lives of all those who be called salvation, bring that person to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Unless the Lord of hosts had not done this and left us a posterity, means a seed from which a, a plant germinates, it refers to children, it refers to offspring, it refers to descendants. And you see what would have happened to us too if the Lord had not left for us a posterity or made us a seed or a descendant. We would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. That would be us. The destruction that came upon Sodom and Gomorrah illustrates how God will carry out His plan, execute His judgment on the earth, on the unsaved person. It, it reveals the, the carrying out of that judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. You know they had to flee and Abraham and Lot had to flee and not look back, and they had to flee. God's judgment was coming on those two places. And that's what would happen to us had not the Lord of hosts made us a descendant and follower of His. So judgment will come thoroughly and quickly when it comes. And only God's sovereign mercy spares the remnant, those whom He has saved. So then, go down to verse 30. What shall we say then? saying that, doesn't he? Like, what shall we say then? How can this be? That's why I was glad when we, I was glad for us to say, amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, or you're saved, my king would die for me? What shall we say to them? And it was good that um, Brother John brought us back to uh, the end of Romans 8. What shall we say then to 
this uh, love. Nothing will separate us from this love. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attain righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. So you see how utterly overwhelming the doctrine of election is. In verses 30 through 33, we see God's sovereignty and human responsibility here working together. Where it starts to mention in verse 32 about the stumbling stones. I'll get to that in a minute. God requires faith on the part of man, yet this is not inconsistent with his sovereignty over election. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility at work. And the Gentiles, non-Jews, who are not pursuing righteousness in that sense, like the Jews were. Paul talked about how he was a Pharisee of Pharisees and pursuing righteousness. The Gentiles are not pursuing it in that sense, but instead attain the righteousness that was given to them through faith. It's always been by faith that people are justified and made right with God. That's why I am so thankful, and God obviously put it on my heart, to ask my mother, I was telling somebody else that this week, that question, what must I do to be saved? How can I know that when I die I'm going to go to heaven? In essence, I'm saying, how can I be just? I knew that God was holy. And how can I be made right with God? And again, her answer to that question, God just used to kind of plague me for many years. How good enough? Your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds, as she said. I was thinking about her this past week in light of this message. Your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds. I could hear her saying that to me. And I could just remember the love of a mother toward her son, who she just felt like was just, of course you're good enough. You're my son. You're Kathleen Stevens' son. You're going to be good enough. Are you kidding me? That's what she thought. Romans 1.17 says, For it is in the righteousness, for it is for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And that's also Habakkuk 2 verse 4. The righteous man shall live by faith. That doesn't just refer to our election, a righteous man living by faith, but just the ongoing Christian life that we are to live by faith and trust and even when not seen. And really, if we're going to live by faith, just in general, right, this would be a good application for an application before we get there. If we're going to live by faith, what do we have to believe in? What do we have to trust in if we're really and truly going to live by faith? The sovereignty of God. That's sweet, too. you got to get me the i got to just got to keep something to get me the other got to get me the other light. Okay. The just will live by faith. Then it says the Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness attain righteousness. Pursue means to run swiftly after something, like hunting after something. It was used of earnestly seeking or desiring a goal or an object. And the Jews did not pursue righteousness that was by faith, but instead relied upon their birthright. Their supposed good deeds outweighing their bad deeds. Self-righteousness really is perhaps one of the greatest obstacles, if not the greatest obstacle to salvation. The self-righteous person doesn't feel like they have any need at all for God. Verse 31 is again this sovereign election and this sovereign grace. Israel, but Israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law. Those who try to obtain righteousness by works will never obtain that's what kept bothering me. I'll never attain my good deeds. How will they ever outweigh my bad deeds? What needs to happen and what has happened to us, those whom God has saved, is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So you see why here, beloved, people in pursuit of their own self-righteousness will never attain it. The answer is there in verse 32. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, that as though it were by works, and they stumbled over the stumbling stone. 
in their failure to pursue righteousness by faith. All unbelievers, anybody even today who's unsaved, who's not yet a believer, ultimately is stumbling over the stumbling stone. I was trying to explain that this past week, going through some of these verses in a much different way with the dear ladies, because they're all ladies at Middlebury Convalescent at Home, and talking about this and many of them were brought up in the church and have a sense of self-righteousness because of their religious tradition. But as I say, I'm always sharing Christ with them. And many of them may have stumbled over the stumbling stone. And I just keep was pointing out to them who Jesus Christ was. Ultimately, the unsaved person stumbles over Christ. Certainly that's what happened in Israel's day. That's what happened in Jesus' day. Unsaved people of every generation ultimately stumble over Christ, the stumbling stone. Isaiah, uh, verse 33, is uh, seen in, is quoted in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 12 through 15. You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this is, people call a conspiracy. And you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. That's just a nice verse right there for point of application to put on your recipe card box and memorize. And you are not to fear what they fear, or be in dread of what they dread. It is the Lord of hosts, oh, there's that word, those words, whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. Then he shall become a sanctuary. It's interesting, if he is our fear, if he is our dread, if we have that holy reverence, potential fear for him, then he will become a sanctuary. Both to both, but to both houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants. Many will stumble over them and they will fall and be broken. And they will even be snared and caught. So if you stumble over this stumbling, if you stumble over Christ, your fate will be that which is what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah and the judgment of God will come upon that person. And that's why, who Jesus is. You know, in Luke chapter 2, verses 34 and 35, was the, when Jesus was presented at the temple, and Simeon and later Anna, the prophetess, uh, had seen Jesus. And this is what Jesus Christ does. Verse 34, even to this day, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child, Christ, is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul, he says to Mary, to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Christ is the cause of the rise and the fall of men. What a person does with Jesus Christ. That's the sovereign grace, human responsibility part of this. Ultimately, all people who are unsaved have stumbled over Christ by failing to recognize their need for Him, trust in Him, turn to Him for salvation, repentance of their sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I was thinking of, uh, I won't say His name on the video, but a friend of mine that I went to high school, I was reminded this past week by another friend that I went to high school with, of our friend who has leukemia. He's the exact same age as me, and graduated the same year as me, and he has leukemia, and so they, my friend asked me to pray for our friend who has leukemia, and he um, is Jewish, but he's a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. He's a believer. In fact, I talked to him on the phone, oh boy, how many years ago, when he heard I was here, and we were just uh, celebrating how the Lord had saved us, and you know, we knew each other since kindergarten. And, but this verse describes what happens to anybody who is saved, who doesn't stumble over the stumbling stone? 1 Corinthians 1, 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Because it's foolishness, it says earlier, to those who are perishing. That's again, the sadness there. The gospel message is going forth. It's going forth to all people. It's foolishness, it's nonsense. How do you know it's nonsense? To those who are perishing, they, they feel like it's nonsense. They don't want anything to do with it. It means nothing to them. 
but it's the wisdom from God. God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe, to save the remnant. For indeed, verse 22, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block into Gentiles' foolishness. But to those who are the called, those who are the elect, those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So Paul says here in Romans 9.33, He who believes in Him will not be disappointed. At any time in the New Testament where that word believed is, uh, appears, it refers to placing one's confidence, placing one's faith, placing one's trust in Christ. So the good news of the Gospel is that anyone who places their faith and trust in Christ will not be disappointed or ashamed. So let's think about applying this. We have a few application points. Because of God's sovereign election and because of God's sovereign grace on those whom He has saved, because it's all for the glory of His name, let's think about it again and let's ask ourselves the question, am I, am I among the people of God? Am I among the people of God? How did I come to be among the people of God? Well, obviously, God in sovereign grace gave you that call that, that call that you responded to, His election. We've read this verse before, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. Why? For what purpose? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who's called you, called you, called you. Election, election, election. Called you out of His darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you will have received mercy. And he says here in Romans 9, I will have mercy on whom I love mercy. I will harden on whom I will harden. And the whole point of that hardening part is even there to bring glory to God's name. It's not meant to just drive us into a theological tailspin as, as to how this could be and how could God do this and why, you know, why would he save me or what about this other person? You don't know about the other person. I don't know about my unsaved family members and relatives. God may save them. Right, right now, none of them are saved. Except one in the whole family. One. Recently, one. Presently, one. Nobody else. Nobody else. And it's not meant to cause me to wonder or to question, or, but it's just to cause me to appreciate more fully that he saved a wretch like me. That he saved a wretch like you. He says here, and back in 21, do not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same that lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Why? He did so to make known the whole election process is to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy whom we are, which he prepared beforehand for us. So, again, if you're among the people of God, may it just so profoundly affect the way we live in the present. And if you're not among the people of God, don't harden your heart any, any longer. Turn to Him in repentance and faith today to be saved. Romans 11, 5. In the same way, then, they, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. That's why I, that verse alone is why we have to probably go to Romans 10 and 11 too. Verse 6 says, But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And there's a whole bunch of great verses there, which I won't read.
7 through 9. Just read Romans 9, 10 and 11. Just keep reading Romans 9, 10 and 11. Those verses that follow talk about the stumbling stone, talk about those who have rejected Christ, the Israel, nation of Israel, and how that opened the door for the gospel to go forth to the Gentiles, us, and for us to be saved. So because of his sovereign election, because of his sovereign grace, let's praise God. Let's never forget that we are now, forever and always, people loved by God. We are now, forever, now, forever and always, people loved by God. You know, like when you were dating back when, or maybe with your spouse, and you would sign your little cards. Remember you used to send cards? You would send a card or a note, and sometimes people would sign with, love you now, forever and always, or something like that. Let's praise God by never forgetting that we are now, forever, and always people loved by God. Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 through 20. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness, and in justice, in loving kindness, and in compassion. I will betroth you to me. This is God saying, I will betroth you to me. In faithfulness, then you will know that I am the Lord. And he says in Jeremiah 31 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So let's be more active in the pursuit and enjoyment of knowing Christ more, knowing Christ more intimately, growing in holiness. Verse 30 said, What shall we know? Say then, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness. What shall we say then? Let's be more active in our pursuit there of the Lord and in knowing Him. That was one of the great things about as a new Christian, just that. And again, I wasn't, I didn't have the privilege of going in a church where the gospel was proclaimed, so that made me even more hungry. And I was brought up in two religious traditions, as you know, and neither one of them talked about knowing God or knowing Christ or knowing Jesus personally. So I'm hearing this, it's just blowing me away. And I'm loving it and enjoying it so much as like I couldn't get enough. I was like an active pursuit. And then that's how our whole Christian life is meant to be. An active pursuit of knowing Christ Jesus more personally, more intimately. That's what Paul said. I've always loved those verses. I've mentioned them so many times to you. Philippians 3, 8 and following. More than that, I count all things, all things to be lost. Imagine if we counted all things in our life be lost or not important or not important not more important in view of the surpassing remember imagine if our sole goal and purpose in life now even as a saved man or woman would be that we would know the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord see if he's not he needs to become more of the surpassing value and treasure of our life otherwise all the trinkets of this world hold more allurement to us. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the Lord, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection, in the fellowship of His suffering, and being conformed to His death. And later on, a couple of verses later, he says, not that I've already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on, or I pursue Christ, so that I may press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also had laid hold of me. I don't regard myself as laying hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, reaching toward what is ahead. Imagine if the Lord helped us to live more like this. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. But what did he lay hold of you for? Christ-likeness, holiness, looking more like him, trusting in him, growing in him, growing in holiness, being perfected. That's what he laid hold of you for. And then also that we would share that message, that we would proclaim that excellencies with others. So let's share the gospel unashamedly with people 
who need to know the Messiah. I said, well, that's how we need to apply this. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul said in Romans 1.16, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. Acts chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, He, the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone, there is salvation in no other name given under heaven by which we may be saved. Acts 4, 12. We share that with the unsaved person, that they too may be reconciled to God. We do things that make no earthly sense. Hyperism. We're not for Christ and His resurrection. We do things. We, 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 we minister. We, we take a hit for Jesus. We, and whatever that means for anybody, each person is different. But have you ever done anything that makes no earthly sense? You're being persecuted for it. You're being spit on for it. You're being treated lousily because you're doing it for Christ's sake so that that person can see the light and the glory of Jesus Christ and be saved and be spared. The Sodom and Gomorrah judgment of hell that is coming down upon their life. That even in the present moment, apart from Christ, the wrath of God abides on that person. And you're willing to do something that you don't need to do. You don't need to, you don't need to do it. The world would tell you not to do it. My flesh tells me every day not to do it. But you do it. And sometimes you don't even do it so well. But you do it for Christ's sake and for His glory. That people could know Him and the power of His resurrection. Because your life is not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify Him with your life, with your body. All right, last application. So, His sovereign election, choice. His sovereign grace, irresistible call. So think about this. That's His sovereign grace choosing us. I mean, His sovereign election choosing us, grace. Think about this. I thought about this one. How do you do, how have you done this past, the day isn't that long, this past day, or let's just say, how did you do yesterday? How did you do last week? How did you do last month? How did you do last year? Fulfilling God's reason and purpose for your election. His reason and purpose for your election and my election wasn't just to keep us out of hell. His reason and purpose for our election is that we would be more like Christ that we would look like Him, that we would resemble Him, although imperfect and although struggling at times, barely handling, hanging on at times. But that was, that's what His purpose is for us, that we would be, look more like Christ and that we would share that gospel message with people in word, in deed, in whatever realm, whatever area of responsibility and calling He has placed on you, based on your gifts, based on the opportunities that you have, based on the people even that he's put into your life. Ephesians 1. So think about, I was thinking about that. How am I doing? Yesterday, last week, last year, last month, in fulfilling God's purpose for my election, which is all due to what he has done. Not what I have done. I'm deserving, we're deserving hell. He saved us from that. Blessed be the God and Father, Ephesians 1.3 of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us, election, in Him, before the foundation of the world, nothing foreseen good in that person. We covered that. That we would be holy and blameless before Him. That's the purpose. Holy, blameless, Christ-like, growing in holiness. How are you doing? How are we doing? How am I doing? In fulfilling that purpose which God has for us in how he's electing us. Romans 8, 29 and 30 say it. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son.
so that we would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So God's sovereign election, his choice, God's sovereign grace, his irresistible grace is for the, on those whom he has saved is for the glory and honor of his name. So this is utterly overwhelming. For the past weeks, we've been, three weeks, we've been swimming in the ocean of his sovereign election and his sovereign grace. So the foundational question, in two quick closing verses, I guess, will you leave here this morning disappointed or ashamed of Christ? That's what verse 33 says. He who believes in him, he who trusts in him, he who relies in him, he who believes in his sovereign election and his sovereign grace, he who lives like they believe in his sovereignty and not look like a practical atheist, won't be disappointed, it says. So not yet believer, don't leave here this morning disappointed or ashamed of Christ. Leave here this morning this way. Romans 10, 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. The unsaved man or woman or child or youth or whatever, they're afraid to give up their whatever, their stuff, their sin, their, their lusts, their pleasures, because they think they'll be disappointed in some way if they had to give up that stuff for Christ's sake. No, I'm not saying this. The Bible says this. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. We can have testimony after testimony after testimony of people in this room who have been saved. And they're not disappointed because of what Christ has done for us. And this is kind of it's interesting. Over half the congregation today is from Middlebury. That's very odd, Brother John. Today, we got all the, all the Middlebury residents are ones represented here. For the most part, half and half. That's kind of cool. Middlebury and the surrounding area we're trying to reach. We love the people in Oxford and Watertown and all the other areas too. You will not be disappointed. In fact, you'll be blessed. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then, children of God, child of God, let's never be ashamed of Jesus, certainly. And let's never lose sight of His preciousness. His preciousness. First Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 is the last ones I'm going to read, and then one verse at the end. For this is contained in Scripture Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for those who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the great cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they're disobedient to the word. Into this doom they were appointed. So you got the contrast from the person who sees the preciousness, the value of Jesus Christ, knowing that they won't be disappointed, have never been disappointed. In, in believing and trusting and knowing the Lord. Never felt like they had to give up this or give up that. But they're given more. They're given the keys to the kingdom. And they're given the joy and the peace and the contentment and the, and the happiness even that the person is striving to have with the sex, with the immorality, with the drugs, with the whatever, to try to fill that emptiness and void in their heart. And the very thing that they're clinging to and not wanting to give up because they're afraid they'll be disappointed is being offered to them. Jesus Christ, forgiveness for sin, treasuring Him above all else, and how He could really change and transform a life and give new meaning and purpose to a person's life. That's the invitation. Hope for the week. John MacArthur Jr. wrote, By His own determination, God will not save a person who does not believe in His Son. And a person cannot save himself by the act of his own will, no matter how sincere and heartfelt. In God's sovereign order, both his gracious provision and the exercise of man's will are required for salvation. Like many other revelations in Scripture, those truths, those two truths, cannot be fully harmonized by reason, but only accepted by faith.
So the invitation here to the unsaved person, to the not yet believer, is this. You're given an opportunity to exercise your faith right now. The sovereign call of God has gone out. His irresistible grace draws a person. You're given the opportunity right now to exercise your will. Okay? You should like that. I get to do I get to exercise my will. The exercise of your will is required. Human responsibility is required. Will you turn to Christ today in repentance and faith be saved? Will you come forward? Will you confess? Will you call upon the name of the Lord today to be saved? Will you come and stand up here and talk with Brother John and I? Come right over here and, and lay down under this cross so I can tell Maria Beaumont, who was not able to be here today, not because of the storm, but because of a family thing, that somebody came. Somebody came. We've been praying week after week after month after year that they would just come forward and bow down under this cross and that was all that they would have to do. The expression of their desire to know Jesus Christ. We assure the person based on the authority of God's word they will not be disappointed. You will not be disappointed if you call upon the name of the Lord in that way. John 6.37 close says, All that the Father gives me will come. That's what's so great about being up here, right, Brother John? And to proclaim it and to share it. The confidence and the assurance that we have all that the Father gives will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away from. And based on the other scriptures, I will never disappoint that person. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the salvation and forgiveness of sin that comes only from you. Thank you for your sovereign election and your choice and your sovereign grace to that irresistible, uh, to, that, to that call, the irresistible grace that goes forth. Lord, will someone come to you today, someone sitting here or someone watching? Will they come to you today? All that comes to you, you promise you will not drive away. And we thank you and praise you, Lord. And we thank you and praise you that those who know you, you said will never be disappointed or ashamed of you or disappointed that they've followed you instead of living their life to eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow they will die. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.